Hello everyone, welcome. This is your first lecture in Vagrant Essentials Build Portable Environments by Edionics. My name is Ahmed and I hope you're going to enjoy this course. And this section will serve as a general introduction to the topic. In case you don't know anything about Vagrant or virtualization, we are going to introduce virtualization as a concept. What problems did virtualization solve and how and why Vagrant was introduced? And what are the enhancements that Vagrant adds to virtualization? So let's get started. So let's start with an introduction to virtualization. As you can see here, if you have a look at the picture here, this is a picture of a man that is wearing a virtual reality glasses. Of course, this is not the topic of this section. However, it's closely related to what we're going to discuss. As you can see here, using this virtual tool, this guy is acting as if he is inside a data center full of computer racks. As you can see here behind him, we have a lot of server racks. These are virtual. These are not real. Now, in order to know what virtualization is, you have to have a look at how life was before virtualization was introduced. I'm talking here about life of a developer, someone who spends most of his work time developing projects and writing code, building and running this code on his or her machine, spotting bugs, returning back to the editor, doing changes, adding features, and then building and testing again and so on. This is the typical workflow of a developer. So, what was a developer's life before virtualization? If you are a developer living in those days where virtualization was not available to desktop computers, you had to use your own machine for your development tasks. This meant installing the infrastructure on your private computer. For, so, for example, if you have perhaps a separate hard disk for your development, a second network card, a second physical network card, if you're going to test connecting to a different network, so the first thing is installing the infrastructure on your private computer. And by infrastructure, I mean the services that the software depends on to run. So for example, if you are if you want to run a web application written in, for example, AngularJS or PHP, for example, this web application will need a web server first. So we're going to have to install either Apache or Nginx or whatever the web server was. So the first thing you're going to install is the operating system. And most people prefer Linux and Unix variants over Windows when they are developing web applications written in PHP. Of course, this is not a requirement, but it's just how things go in web development. If you're working with ASP.NET or any of the .NET development languages, you are obliged to use Windows. If you are working with PHP or any of the open source projects that are available now, most developers find that it's much better to work on Linux when developing such projects. So now you have a difficult choice whether you're going to install Windows as the primary operating system of your machine or you're going to resort to one of the Linux distros like Red Hat, for example, or Ubuntu. This, of course, meant that this operating system will be both your development operating system, which means that this is the operating system on which you are going to develop your applications, and also it is going to be your personal operating system. So if you want to, for example, play a game, for example, or surf the net or do any other personal task that you are going to do on your personal computer, you're going to use that operating system for that purpose. Of course, you could use the dual boot mechanism where you can install two or more operating systems on the same machine, but you'll have to boot to one operating system as, at a time. Of course, this is a lot of headache if you want to use Windows and at the same time resort to Linux when you want to resume your development activities. The second point is that any physical components must be purchased separately. So, for example, if you are developing an application where more than one host should be involved, perhaps in the testing phase, you want to test from different hosts at the same time, you will have to physically buy those hosts. You will physically have to buy another computer, put it in your workspace, perhaps buy a network switch or a hub, the necessary cables, the necessary network cards, and so on. So, as you can see here, it becomes more and more difficult to build multiple environments because you'll have to physically purchase everything and you'll have to physically install an operating system where it's going to be your primary operating system as long as you are doing your developmental tasks. Eventually, this led to more effort, higher costs, more time, and accordingly, of course, less profits. So what is virtualization? To solve all those problems and to enhance software development and to add more and more features to the software development lifecycle, virtualization was introduced. Actually, virtualization is a very old concept. It dates back to the early 60s when the first computer was ever invented. But it hasn't been used 
in desktop environments, except since recent, maybe in the early 90s, that virtualization started to be adopted in desktop computers. Virtualization as a term refers to the ability of one machine to host multiple other virtual machines running possibly different operating systems. And the reason we're calling them virtual or virtualization is that those operating systems are not hosted on physical hardware. When you are having a Windows operating system, for example, and you are installing a Red Hat Enterprise Linux as a virtual machine over Windows, Red Hat sees that it is using a separate hard disk, a separate CPU, a separate chip of memory, and a separate physical network card. This is all not real, this is all virtual. These are all software abstractions of the real hardware that exists on the host machine. So, for example, you can have one machine running Windows, and using virtualization software like VMware or VirtualBox, for example, you can create one or two or three or more operating systems from different vendors, from different types. You can install Linux along a third Oracle Solaris Unix and all on the same machine. You can use Windows for your personal tasks, and you can resort to Linux on the same machine without having to do anything, just with a click of a button or a mouse click, you can head on to Linux, do whatever tasks you want, like continue developing your web applications, testing it and so on, and then return back to Windows when you're finished. Hosted machines, let's call them guests, have their own virtual CPUs, memory network cards, and even their own private networks that are completely separate from the host's own network. You no longer have to purchase separate physical hardware, you can create a complete private network on your host machine, connect several hosts with each other in a network that is privately separated from the host network, from the network where, where, where your physical computer is connected to. This is a separated, isolated network between those hosts. And of course, you can make it public. You can make it connected to the public network where the host is connected to. They act as if they were separate machines on the network. So as you can see here, virtualization, created a whole new set of possibilities for software developers. Software development under virtualization became a lot and a lot easier. And of course, it costed less time, less money, and accordingly, it yielded higher profits. But that was not enough, unfortunately. Virtualization has been used for a while and helped make the lives of a lot of developers easier. But in the fast-paced, ever-changing world of web and application development, virtualization alone was just not enough. And here's why. First, applications becoming more complex with the advent of new languages and technologies. Now, 10 years ago, or maybe a little more, you are bound to just a bunch of web development languages. If you want to create a web application, for example, it had to be either ESP or ESP.NET, if you're using the .NET language, with C Sharp, say, or VB.NET, or any .NET language. You're going to host this application, of course, on Windows Internet Information Services, or IIS. Or you can resort to one of the open source languages. Back then, there was only PHP, perhaps Ruby, Python, and a few others. But now, the list is a lot and a lot more. For example, we have now JavaScript, no longer regarded as a client-only language. It's now what's called a full-stack language. You can use JavaScript from the moment you power on your web server. And if you want an example, you have the Node.js, a very, very popular application server powered by JavaScript. You can use JavaScript to power this web server. You can use it as, an, as a server-side language. The same way you use PHP, for example, of course, with the due differences. And you can use it on the client, the same way you used it before. So web frameworks like AngularJS, like Backbone.js, and a lot more are being widely adopted now to make dynamic web applications. And of course, with the advent of those new technologies and those new languages, server configuration increased in its complexity because you no longer now have just to configure a web server. Now you have to configure the web server, configure the framework on which you are installing the web, the web applications. So for example, if you're working with PHP, there are now a bunch of PHP frameworks in the market like Laravel, like Codeigniter, like the Zen framework and so on. These frameworks need needed to be installed both web server and PHP installation. So long ago, you had only to install the web server and the module that connected that web server to the language, for example, PHP, and that's it. But now you have web frameworks, you have plugins, you have libraries, those need to be installed after the web server and the language is installed. They are now part of the infrastructure. Another example is WordPress. Think of hundreds of thousands of websites that are built using WordPress. Now, if you want to quickly develop a web application in WordPress, it's no more enough to just install or configure the web server, install PHP and set up MySQL and that's it. You will have to install WordPress and you have to ensure that its proper configuration is done. 
Perhaps you're gonna install also MySQL management tool like phpMyAdmin and so on. All these tools, all these libraries, all these modules and applications and frameworks are being part of the infrastructure. The infrastructure is growing more and more complex. And with the advent of agile development methodology, if you read a little about software development methodologies, you sure have stumbled upon the agile development. Agile development has decreased dramatically the life cycle of the application. Now, instead of developing an application in like six months to one year and then deploying it or testing it, taking the feedback and then going back to fix the bugs and add new features and so on. Now, an application prototype has to be developed in less than a week. So as you can see, the life cycle has dramatically decreased. The need to deploy the application on more and more environments for testing, debugging, and so on has increased. And for all those reasons, we have now a new buzzword that has been around since a little while, which is called DevOps. DevOps is the combination of the word development and the word operations. It is basically blurring out the lines between the developers, the system administrators, and the operators. Now, everybody is working in a team. The developer should no longer rely on the system administrator solely to provide or avail the infrastructure that is required to deploy the application and test it. A new job has been introduced, which is a DevOps engineer. This is basically a job where the DevOps engineer would be able to avail the required infrastructure, deploy the application, and start testing it. Accordingly, virtualization needed to be augmented with automation technologies, among which is applications like Docker and Vagrant. Now, in the next lecture, we are going to start defining Vagrant, what it actually is, what it can do, what it can add to virtualization, and then jump into the installation process. So, see you next.